According to Roman mythology, an ancient king, King Numitor, took the throne of Alba Longa, an ancient city in central Italy, when his father died. However, Numitor's brother, Amelius, forced Numitor from the throne, took over as king himself, and murdered Numitor's sons, hoping to prevent anyone in Numitor's line from ever challenging him. Amelius even made Numitor's daughter, Rhea Silvia, become a Vestal Virgin. This meant that she was committed to serve the gods, and most importantly, she was to remain chaste. Amelius assumed that this would prevent Rhea from ever giving birth to a male heir in Numitor's line. But Mars, the god of war, intervened at this point. Mars either seduced or raped Rhea Silvia, and she became pregnant with his twin sons, Romulus and Remus. As we turn from Greece to Rome, our study of mythology becomes a bit more complicated. Much of Rome's mythology is tied up with Greek mythology. Many of Rome's great mythological characters and themes are imported directly from Greece. A few figures and storylines, however, are unique to Roman mythology. We begin in this lecture with one of the few truly Roman myths, the story of Rome's founding by the twin brothers Romulus and Remus. The story of Romulus and Remus really begins after their grandfather's defeat, when the new king, Amelius, discovers that Rhea is pregnant. When Amelius finds this out, he puts her under watch in prison until she gives birth. Rhea delivers the twin boys, Romulus and Remus. At this point, King Amelius orders that the mother and both twin boys be imprisoned. In one version of the story, Rhea is buried alive, and the twins are left to die of exposure. In another version, Amelius orders that all three be drowned in the Tiber River. Notice that right from the beginning, the founding story of Rome involves violence on multiple levels. A rightful king is displaced and thrown in prison. His male heirs are slaughtered. His daughter is forced into a life of chastity, and then she's either seduced or raped by the god of war, Mars. The twins, Romulus and Remus, are cast into a river to drown. Right away, it's clear how much Roman identity is intertwined with war and with violence. Keep this in mind. We'll return to this point a little bit later. In every version of this myth, a servant who has been ordered to kill the twins decides to defy the king's orders. Instead of murdering the infants, the servant leaves the twins in a basket beside the riverbank. The river, river itself takes the basket and guides the twins downstream to safety, as if it had a will of its own. The basket floats gently into the roots of a tree, where a she-wolf named Lupa comes upon the baby boys. Lupa suckles the twins, and a woodpecker, Picus, brings them food. And as a side note, both of these creatures are special to the god Mars, the boy's father. The twins are then discovered by a shepherd and his wife, who take them home and raise them as their own sons. The boys grow up completely unaware of their royal origins, working as shepherds like their foster father. Notice the contrast here between the world the boys originated from and the world in which they grew up. Through their mother, Romulus and Remus were descendants of the most politically powerful family in the region. They are the products of the highest levels of civilization. By contrast, their father is Mars, the god of war. But Mars is also the god of spring, nature, fertility, and the earth. And the boy's childhood reflects this. They are saved by animals and raised by shepherds. So there's an interesting celebration of simplicity, earthly life, and nature in the boy's birth story. And you can see here the ancient Roman appreciation for nature. However, the myth takes an interesting turn. As might be expected, the boys don't grow up to be ordinary men. They emerge as leaders in their local community, particularly in defiance of the king. Eventually, they lead an outright rebellion against Amelius. They kill him, and they reestablish Numitor as king, still completely unaware that he is their grandfather. 
At this point, instead of remaining at home, Romulus and Remus strike out on their own. They don't attempt to seize the throne for themselves, as one might reasonably expect, and they don't ask Numitor for any political or economic rewards. Instead, they strike out on their own. This is when trouble begins to brew between the two brothers. Romulus decides to establish a new city on the Palatine Hill. According to the mythology, this is the very place where Lupa cared for Romulus and Remus when they were babies. The Palatine Hill is also the centermost of seven hills where Rome is located. Remus, however, wants to establish the city on the Aventine Hill, the southernmost hill of the seven hills of Rome, just southwest of the Palatine Hill. In one version of the story, they both look up to the heavens for a sign from the gods as to which location is right for the new city. Remus sees six vultures, and then Romulus sees twelve. One group of followers decides that Remus was meant to be king over a city on the Aventine Hill because he saw the birds first. But another group decides that Romulus was meant to rule from the Palatine Hill because he saw more birds. In another version of the story, the two brothers decide to cast lots to determine which site to choose for their city, but they end up quarreling over whose site the lots indicate. The quarrel escalates. Remember their childhood connection to Mars, the god of war? And ultimately, Romulus kills Remus. Romulus establishes his new city and names it Roma after himself. Now notice what just happened here. Our two heroes, sons of the god of nature and the heroes who rightfully restored Numitor to his throne, suddenly fight to establish their own city, a new city on a hill, marking the spot where they were cared for by a she-wolf. Rome, the great metropolitan city of its time, saw its roots both in an ancient royal family, a god of war, and in the foster sons of a shepherd, situated on a high hill where a she-wolf suckled two abandoned boys. It's a study in contrasts, and one that ancient Romans seem to have been proud of. In many cultures, the origin story would end here, but not in Roman culture. The story continues and adds a highly hierarchical political dimension with great attention to administration. Romulus takes some very specific steps to establish security for his city. He begins by creating an army, including the first legions, military units made up of 3,000 infantry and 300 cavalry, according to the Roman historian Livy. He also establishes the city's government. He institutes an advisory council, the patricians, so named because they are given fatherly responsibility for Rome. This group is also known as the Senate because it draws from senior leaders in the community. Thus, Romulus is credited with establishing the form of government that marked ancient Rome. The mythology continues. The city of Roma attracts single men, mostly men in search of a better life than they currently have. And the population expands quickly to occupy five of the seven hills of Rome. This quick growth is great, except for one thing. Unfortunately, there are very few women. Romulus risks losing his new male citizens to other communities. So in order to provide brides for his city's rapidly expanding male population, Romulus decides to kidnap women from the neighboring community Sabinium. In an elaborate charade, Romulus invites all the Sabine men and women to a great festival. Romulus provides extravagant entertainment for the Sabine men there, and he gets them drunk with wine. Once the Sabine men are out of commission, Romulus kidnaps their daughters, and they are quickly married to Roman men. Initially, the Sabine daughters are terrified. But once they realize that they will be properly married and cared for by devoted husbands, the Roman myth claims that they become happy with their situation. Understandably, the Sabine men are not so happy. They demand that their daughters be returned. Romulus refuses. The Sabine men attack Rome, 
but Romulus receives help from the god Jupiter, and the Sabine army is defeated. At this point, the Sabine women, who are now firmly attached to their Roman husbands, intervene. They beg for peace between the Romans and the Sabines, essentially between their fathers and their husbands. Eventually, peace is established with the Romans and the Sabines based on two different hills. Romulus and Tatius, the Sabine king, rule as joint kings until Tatius is conveniently assassinated. At that point, Romulus becomes the sole king of the entire region. For a period of time, we see a relatively peaceful consolidation of government and military power. A joint senate is established. The Sabines adopt the Roman calendar, while the Romans adopt the battle armor and the shield style of the Sabines. And together, they form a formidable army. Rome's founding story, then, is a story of men fighting men. Brothers overthrowing brothers, nephews deposing uncles, brothers killing brothers, men abducting, abducting the daughters of other men, kings assassinating other kings. One wonders if the violence in this founding myth reflects Rome's broader experience, which included violent dictatorial rulers and significant family feuding to the point of assassinations. Think Julius Caesar, Brutus, and Caligula. Back to the founding myth. Over time, Romulus becomes more dictatorial. He fails to consult the Senate when making important decisions, and gradually he alienates the city's leaders. There's absolutely no mention of the common people who don't figure at all in Rome's founding story beyond Romulus and Remus's foster parents. Romulus's death is just as miraculous as his birth. In most versions of the story, Romulus simply disappears in a windstorm shortly after having offered a public sacrifice. Rumors begin to circulate that the Senate had Romulus assassinated in response to his dictatorial ways. The Senate, in response to these rumors, bestows posthumous honors on Romulus, and the senators circulate stories describing him ascending into heaven. The Roman historian Livy writes that Romulus appeared to Proculus, a well-known public Roman figure. According to Livy, Proculus claimed that Romulus appeared to him, declaring that the gods themselves had decided that Rome would be the capital of the world, and no army on earth would be able to vanquish the Roman army. Proculus declared that Romulus ascended into heaven after making this speech. In some accounts, Romulus transforms into Quirinius, one of the three preeminent Roman gods. The story of Rome's founding sounds a bit fantastic to modern Western ears, and most historians believe that Rome was not founded by Romulus. Instead, they argue that Romulus and Remus were invented completely out of thin air. Archaeological evidence suggests that Rome evolved gradually out of the growth of several agricultural villages around the seven hills that eventually joined together to form the city. If so, then the story of Romulus and Remus might be seen as metaphorical. Rome came from small village roots, but over time it took its rightful place as a cultural and political metropolis on a hill. If this is what happened, then the story of Romulus and Remus represents the evolution of an entire people from small town folk, from small town folk to big city powers. However, we have evidence that the myth of Romulus and Remus, fictional though it may be, was told with great pride in ancient Rome. It appears in the earliest known written history of Rome, written by the Greek author Diocles of Paparitus in the 3rd century BCE. Ancient historians seem to have believed that Romulus and Remus were actual historical figures, and they taught that the city was named for Romulus. In fact, the story of Romulus and Remus was circulated widely to Rome's allies, and we know that the myth was used as the official version of Rome's history in the late Republic and early Imperial era, roughly around the first century BCE. Roman historians argued that the city was founded somewhere between 758 and 728 BCE. Plutarch gets very specific, 
dating the twins' birth to March 771 BCE. By the late 3rd century BCE, we find images of a she-wolf suckling twin boys on Roman coins. The greatness of Rome was tied up with its mythology, so wherever Roman culture was spread, so did its founding story. The story of Romulus and Remus was also communicated through visual imagery, especially in paintings and sculpture, and certain motif traditions developed. Images of the twins always show a shepherd, the she-wolf, the twins under a fig tree, or one or two birds if they follow the Livy or the Plutarch versions of the story. Alternatively, images based on the mythology of Rome, as told by Dionysius of Halicarnassus, author of the Roman Antiquities in the first century BCE, include two shepherds, the she-wolf, or the twins in a cave, but they rarely include a fig tree and never any birds. The image of the she-wolf suckling the twins eventually became an iconic representation of Rome that had remarkable influence long after Rome had fallen. One of the most famous examples of the image appears on a famous 7th century CE Anglo-Saxon ivory box known as the Franks casket. This box includes a carving of Romulus and Remus included with images from lots of other stories. One interpretation suggests that the box functioned as a kind of a talisman, protecting a warrior on his way to battle. Romulus and Remus are depicted in a setting that would have been familiar to any Anglo-Saxon military man. They're seated in a grove, accompanied by two wolves and four kneeling warriors. Another famous example is the Capitoline Wolf, a she-wolf sculpture in bronze suckling two baby boys. Now this one is especially interesting given the fact that the image is Etruscan, probably created in the 5th century BCE. The figures of the two boys were actually added later to the sculpture, maybe even as late as the 15th century CE. So the original sculpture had nothing to do with the founding of Rome. However, the posture of the she-wolf works beautifully for a depiction of the myth. The she-wolf stands over the boys, watchful, apparently protecting them as well as nursing them. Given the fact that scholars almost universally agree that the Romulus and Remus myth lacks historical basis, the wealth of imagery depicting the brothers is surprising. My sense is that the historical truth of the story meant relatively little to the Romans, or even to those who followed them. What mattered was the myth, because the myth captured the spirit of Rome, its sense of its own destiny, its divine roots, its political sophistication, and its seemingly invincible army. At its height, Rome had no need for historical truth in its myth. Instead, its founding mythology conveyed the heart of Rome. This is a key facet of mythology, especially origins mythology. It conveys truth of a different order, truth about identity rather than truth about history. The sheer number of Romulus and Remus images that we find testify to the fact that Rome's assertion of its identity carried weight. We should note here that several different variants of the Romulus and Remus story circulated throughout the Roman world. The myth was never completely fixed. One version names Hercules as the twins' father rather than Mars. Another version states that Amelius himself was their father. One version traces the twins' genealogy through Numitor back to the half-god Trojan prince Aeneas. Based on this ancestry, Romulus would have been an early ancestor of Rome's first imperial dynasty. There are also different versions of Remus's death. Livy provides two different versions. In the most widely accepted version, Romulus began to build the foundations for walls around the Palatine Hill to mark the boundaries of his city. He did this as Remus and he were arguing about where to establish the city. So the act of digging the foundation trenches was a deliberate act of defiance. Remus responded by humiliating his brother. He publicly insulted the walls and the new city that his brother was beginning to build. In response, Romulus killed his brother, 
declaring that anyone else who insulted his city would suffer the same fate. In other accounts, Remus is killed by a blow to the head by someone other than Romulus, and Romulus buries his brother with honor. Finally, in one text, Remus actually outlives Romulus and founds his own city, Remuria, just a few miles away from Rome. As you might expect, modern scholars approach the Romulus and Remus story like any other origins myth, focusing less on its historical accuracy and more on what it tells us about ancient Roman cultural values. Clearly, the stories reflect Rome's long history of dealing with political conflict with violence, intrigue, military battle, and political alliances. They also reflect the great pride that Rome took in its military and in its form of governance. Finally, the myths teach that individual Romans owe allegiance to Rome and that this allegiance might be tested. As in Greece, there was less emphasis on individual independence than in the modern West. Instead, a man's reputation was determined in large part by what he contributed to the Roman people. Often, this took the form of military or public service, and heroism was valued highly. Modern scholars also argue that the story of Romulus and Remus was actually developed much later than Rome itself. They claim that the story evolved as a way to explain Rome's name. The story conveniently casts Rome's military, government, and social institutions in a certain light. From a scholarly point of view, the city came first, then the origin story, not the other way around. This dynamic actually isn't unusual. Lots of cultures develop stories after the fact in order to explain how things came to be and as part of an effort to justify their political or military domination of other communities. The Romulus and Remus mythology, along with the myth of the rape of the Sabine women, offers a cosmic history of the city and Roman culture, broadly speaking. In this mythic history, Rome sees itself as the pinnacle of the known world, militarily, politically, socially, even geographically. All roads, literal and metaphorical, lead to Rome. We've talked a bit about what the founding of Rome mythology tells us about Roman culture, but what does it tell us about myth? Are there certain themes or elements that we can explore as students of myth rather than as students of Roman history? A quick look reveals several traditional mythic elements. One obvious element is the twin brothers. Brothers figure prominently in a lot of origins mythologies. Think of Cain and Abel. Usually, there's some form of competition or rivalry between the brothers. This becomes intensified when the brothers are twins, such as Jacob and Esau in the Bible. In all these cases, Romulus and Remus, Cain and Abel, Jacob and Esau, the brothers end up fighting with one another. Why is this? Some have argued that this story element reflects real tensions between brothers in the ancient world where older brothers often inherited power, prestige, and property that younger brothers did not. Generally speaking, older brothers fare better in ancient societies than younger brothers do. Neither Romulus nor Remus will relinquish the right to determine where their city will be established. It's significant that they were twins. Neither brother is clearly the elder, so neither brother has an obvious right to overrule the other. The twins' argument is symbolic of the larger issue. Who will wield decision-making power going forward? Romulus and Remus fight for this power, and this reflects family dynamics in ancient cultures around the world. In addition, some scholars have taken a more psychological approach to the struggle between the twin brothers. They argue that twins in mythology represent the dualistic nature of human beings. So the struggles between Romulus and Remus actually represent our own internal conflicts. We are constantly at war with ourselves. Disturbingly, the myth also suggests that we can't escape this internal conflict. One side will ultimately triumph over the other. Rome's founding story also includes another element common in origin mythologies, a miracle. 
In some versions of the Romulus and Remus mythology, the babies are conceived miraculously as the sons of a god and a virgin. In addition, they are saved largely by the miraculous intervention of the Tiber River itself and the care of a she-wolf. The Roman founders survive only because of these miracles. We see a similar motif in other traditions. Most obviously, there's a parallel in the biblical story of Moses. When the baby Moses' life is threatened, his mother sets him in a basket on the river. Miraculously, he's saved, and he's raised in the Pharaoh's household. In many of these stories, the rescued baby, usually a boy, experiences a reversal of circumstances. If he originally came from a prominent family, he's raised in humble circumstances, as we see in the Romulus and Remus myth. If he was born to a poor or a common family, he's raised in a prominent household, as in Moses' case. In all these stories, events conspire to restore the young leader to his rightful place in the social world. And from this point, he takes on the leadership role that he was always meant to assume. In addition, some versions of the Romulus and Remus myth include heavenly events, meant to be read as signs confirming their importance. For example, the Tian poet Antimachus is said to have observed a solar eclipse at the exact time that Romulus started to build Rome's walls. In addition, Romulus allegedly disappeared during a solar eclipse on July 5th, 709 BCE. We see heavenly signs like this in biblical mythology as well. A star hangs in the sky to mark the birthplace of the Christ. This is a hallmark of Origins mythology. Heavenly signs prove that someone is special. Elements such as these, twin brothers, miraculous saves, and heavenly signs, all work together to highlight the importance of a story, elevating it from a mere story or record of history to give it cosmic status, meaning it has implications for the listener. If, as we said earlier, the founding of Rome's story was deliberately circulated beyond Rome itself, to its allies and to its enemies, the story taught that Rome was a special city not to be trifled with. The Romulus and Remus myth invests Rome with special status, suggesting that its establishments and its success occurred against tremendous odds and by the intervention of the gods. As a result, Rome deserves the power it wields over others. Ultimately, of course, Rome falls, like all other civilizations. But the Romulus and Remus myth never suggests this possibility. Instead, it suggests that Rome was meant to rule with invincible power from its founding. I've called this a story of origins rather than a creation story, and there is a bit of a difference. And the distinction tells us one more important Roman quality. Creation stories generally describe the creation of the universe, of the world itself. Creation stories are enormous in scope, encompassing the beginnings of the cosmos, the natural world as we know it, the existence and the nature of human beings, even the origins of the gods sometimes. Origin stories, at least the way we'll use the term, are much narrower. They describe the origins of specific places and specific peoples. As we've seen, Rome's origin story explains where Rome came from, and not a whole lot more. Now, here's the interesting part. Rome doesn't actually have a distinct creation story. And there's a reason for this. Think about it. As I said in the beginning of this lecture, Rome borrows heavily from Greek mythology. One of the things it adopts is Greek creation mythology. As we'll see soon, some names change, but not a whole lot else does. So for all intents and purposes, the Romans just took the Greek version of creation, translated it into Latin, and they were done. Now, I know I'm going to get angry letters and emails about this from some proud Italians, but in general, this is true. But notice that the Romans don't appropriate a Greek story to explain the origins of Rome itself. Rome's pride and joy was the city of Rome, its culture, the military, governmental, and social structures that it developed. Rome developed its own mythology to explain its own origins. And this is crucial, 
because it signals what Rome valued. At the risk of overgeneralizing, Rome cared about Rome, and not a whole lot about the rest of the world. Think of that old New Yorker cartoon depicting a self-centered New Yorker's view of the world. Beyond the borders of Manhattan, the rest of the United States appears comically reduced in size or not at all. Well, Rome saw the world in pretty much the same way. As I've said, scholars dismiss Rome's founding mythology as largely untrue. But if it's just too hard for you to let go of the Romulus and the Remus origin story completely, let me offer you a glimmer of hope. Once in a while, an archaeologist makes a discovery and uses it to try to prove that Romulus and Remus existed and that Romulus founded Rome. And I'll leave you with one of these stories. In 2007, archaeologists were digging in the ruins of Caesar Augustus's palace at the base of the south side of the Palatine Hill. A vast cave was found beneath these ruins. I mean, a really huge cave. The vaulted cavern stretches more than 50 feet below ground, and it is elaborately decorated. Scholars largely agree that this is the Lupercal, a place where the priests of Lupercus, the Roman god of agriculture and shepherds, performed pagan rituals on this site until Pope Gelasius prohibited the practice in 494 CE. But some scholars have gone a step further, arguing that this cave is the actual cave where Romulus and Remus were suckled by the she-wolf Lupa. Now that is quite a leap. Historians and archaeologists continue to disagree about what this particular discovery and others like it actually tell us about Rome's historical founding. What they can all agree on, however, is the fact that the myth itself, quite apart from its historical value, has played an important role in Roman culture and community identity for hundreds of years. As Roman historian and archaeologist Andrea Carandini says, the tale of the birth of Rome is part myth and part historical truth. <laughs>